Welcome to Guides to the Unknown. I'm Kristen. I'm William. We're a weekly show where we tell each other scary stories about weird phenomenon, mysteries, anything that just kind of makes you go, hmm. But this week God. is no different. <laughs> but this week is no different. <laughs> yeah, it's like when uh, Regis Philbin goes like, I hate to tell you this, you got the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> just faked everybody up. The butt is weird. If you said, and this week is no different, would sound better. Yeah, but it wouldn't have a double twist. True, that is a double twist. Mm-hmm. Pretty well, twisty. a double twist for that ass. Why don't you go first? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Yes, I will. Uh, my topic for the week is sort of several topics in one. Okay. To a certain extent. I'm going to tell you all about a mythical creature, and it's going to take us uh, on a little road trip that's going to involve me telling you about other lesser creatures that are related to it. Okay. Um, Kristen, right now, I'm going to ask you to tell me everything that you know about the red dwarf, the Na Rouge. Nothing. Exactly what I predicted. <laughs> Aren't you smug? Pain yeah. In the butt. So this Go is ahead. this is a, a legendary creature. This is um, similar to the way that we talked about banshees a long time ago. It's um, a Something that, if you see it, foretells of doom. It's okay. a bad omen to spot the Na Rouge. Cool. Na Rouge is a French term that I practiced this afternoon with my wife. You're doing beautifully. And decided to do away with any deliberate French pronunciation. Mm-hmm. The Na Rouge. <clears throat> it literally translates to red dwarf. Um, it is also called the demon of the straight. Ooh, okay. Mm-hmm. Like go- str uh, A-I-T. A-I-T. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we're going to go into all of this, but I want to tell you why uh, this is on my radar at all. Because this yeah. is a very obscure yeah. uh, creature guy. Cool. I don't know. He's described as a little man with rotted teeth sometimes. So Ew. he's kind of just a little guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> But I was talking to uh, our dear friend, mm-hmm. Bobby, mm-hmm. Uh, my old writing partner. Mm-hmm. It was his birthday the other day. Yep. I was uh, looking for a cool, weird monster to tell you about, and I got to thinking of some of the stuff that Bobby and I have worked on together. So, Bob, this one's for you. (laughs) Happy birthday. Bobby and I came up with a terrible show that had a great idea at its core. Yeah. Bobby and I, way back when we first started writing together, came up with a show called Edinburgh Falls. Mm -hmm. If you Google that, you might find some of our original pitch documents where you can see how we would have plotted out seasons. We put a lot of our old writing online. Yeah. Um. But the central idea was it was about a writer. It's a very like sort of Stephen King thing. Mm-hmm. I don't think I would, knew that at the time. Yeah. But it's about a writer who uh, is sick of the kind of crap that he's been writing. Mm-hmm. He feels like he has uh, an untapped potential to write a really great book if only people would give him the chance. Yeah. And so he takes advice from his publicist to go to a little town called Edinburgh. Uh, when he goes there, it's supposed to be like a writer's retreat. It's uh, a, a quiet little town nestled in the valley between giant mountains mm-hmm. surrounding it on either side. Um, and uh, he's there and he decides to go to the bar and he has too much to drink and he's staring at himself in the bathroom mirror and he's scratched into the wood and just says, Edinburgh Falls. Yeah. It's kind of weird. There's no waterfalls around here. Right. Um, and then he stumbles around outside, falls over on the uh, curb, and as he's sitting on the side of the road... Uh, he blacks out, wakes up to a little uh, imp mm-hmm. staring at him. I love the word imp. A little mischievous imp. Yeah. Uh, and it sort of clocks him from far away and then scuttles closer to him. And his proportions are all wrong. He's all in shadow. Mm. But you almost get uh, off the moonlight a reddish glint coming off of him, almost like he had red fur. Na Rouge. Na- yeah, the Na Rouge itself. Na Rouge. It foretells of his doom. Cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, Man, I don't remember that aspect of this at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stupid stuff in Edinburgh Falls, but Uh the the central idea of it is still something that I find to be kind of cool. I also – this was way before I had ever really watched Twin Peaks or Mm – this is reminiscent of a lot of other shows, but I still think that this is like an interesting concept that we had come up with. He is terrified of seeing this little you know, red demon thing Mm -hmm. rushes to get the hell out of town. Uh, but as he's driving away on the one dirt road, watching the town disappear yeah. in the rear view mirror, it comes up on the horizon in front of him. Yeah. If you leave, somehow you're driving right back into town. There's yeah. nowhere to go. The way that we chart, uh, said that it would eventually unfold is that uh, Edinburgh is the hotbed from which all mythological monsters 
uh, sprang. Mm -hmm. um, one of the original ideas was that we wanted to just have American folklore come from this place that maybe there are in other countries uh there are different sort of like hot spots or yeah. portals or vortexes or whatever where their sort of mythology comes from but this is distinctly the american one right so we started trying to look up american monsters mm -hmm. and that's what brought us to the not rouge yeah in yeah the first place cool um am i was it another thing where it was like you guys have written something where something was like almost on like a fulcrum or something like that like yeah or was this edinburgh falls oh it's edinburgh falls okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. everything i just told you is all the really good stuff about edinburgh okay. falls but that's all the premise this is yeah. all like what would happen in episode one However, we wanted to go way deeper and plot out what would happen over the course of like five seasons. Mm -hmm. We went really far with the way that we planned our shows. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the things is at a certain point, he can't even drive out of town anymore because the mountains seem like they're growing around the town. Mm -hmm. So bit by bit, the mountains almost start to block out the sun yeah. above them. Like you're in a cage yeah. uh, surrounded by a mountain range. And we were like, well, how the hell are we going to explain that? It's a cool visual, but how do you explain it? Yeah. And then... We landed on, all right, the entire town of Edinburgh is essentially sitting on the head of a gigantic screw Yeah. that bit by bit is being drilled further and further into the right. Earth's core. Right, right, right. And then we started getting into how it was like a government facility that has yeah. known about all these monsters since the beginning of time, and they know that Henry Crane is there, and he, they cannot allow him to leave because of what he's seen, so we must drive the town deeper Crane and deeper. Henry Crane crossover? Oh, this was the original Henry Crane. Oh, okay. I, I, we just ended yeah. up liking the name Henry Crane yeah. and started using it for other stuff. Yeah. But uh, then as we started getting further, we were like, Edinburgh Falls is on the head of a screw. <laughs> we threw the whole show away. Yeah. We stopped working on this show. Wow. But bits of it still rattle around in my head yeah. as interesting concepts. And we put everything out online anyway. So yeah, I feel yeah. very comfortable saying. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, 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 an idea that didn't go anywhere. Yeah. But so that's where the Ney Rouge Mm -hmm. came from and just to give you a little side taste mm -hmm. uh, of of the side taste of explaining a show to you right uh, let me tell you about another monster we found in our research of American folklore yeah. for our uh, show Edinburgh Falls yeah the squonk ooh this was one of the ones that made us go like oh maybe we don't maybe we need more than just American folklore uh -huh. <laughs> the squonk You're starting to hit the bottom of the barrel <laughs> yes the squonk is uh, a creature whose skin is ill fitting. Yeah. It is covered in warts and blemishes, and because of that, it is ashamed of its appearance. It hides from plain sight and spends much of its time weeping. Oh, my God. We wanted to find scary monsters, and we found, like, a loose fitting. What it's a like a bummer. coyote with, like, fat pig skin. Ugh. Hunters who have attempted to catch the squonk have... <laughs> It's also got a terrible name. Yeah, the name you is You can't rough. have an episode of Edinburgh Falls where, like, a squonk is atta attacking yeah. us. Yeah. Like, you could. We just have to have a, a comedic bent. I guess nobody so. can say that seriously. Yeah. Uh, so hunters who have managed to catch it um, have uh, later looked in their satchels <laughs> and found that there is nothing but a, a pool of tears in there. Oh, my God. What a bummer of a monster. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, so that was the squonk. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> that was Edinburgh Falls. Great idea. Everybody follow at Bobby Kester on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, who's still putting out awesome stuff. And yeah. happy birthday, Bob. Yeah. I'm sorry happy if I got your Bobby. Twitter handle wrong. Yeah. I don't know these I think things. It, I think it might be Bobby Kester now. Or look up the Mutoid Man. Or look up Man Salad on YouTube. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so let's get back to the Na Rouge. So this legendary creature comes from Detroit, Michigan. Mm. This is specific to Detroit, Michigan. Surprising. Which is kind of strange. Yeah. Um, its early origins uh, are that Detroit was originally a French settlement. Okay. Uh, but it seems like um, this may be a sort of uh, European or French creature in concept merged with a Native American creature. Huh. Uh, that was also spoken of in that region. And yeah. so those two things eventually sort of combined and became a new thing. Okay. Uh, the Na Rouge. Uh, it's a combination of um, a Native American legend about the offspring of the stone god mm -hmm. and a, a French or European creature called a Lutin, which is another version of an elf, fairy, gnome, hobgoblin. Oh, okay. Or brownie. Yeah. It's it's of the fae variety. Exactly. Yep. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are French fairy tales where they talk about uh, sort of like elemental mm -hmm. lutins that are able to, say, travel uh, through the ground without dying. Oh, cool. Very similar to when you talked about gnomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or like travel through the air, travel through the water without drowning. Yeah, right. So lutins. Um, uh, then that legend of the lutin in France came over to 
that sort of region and in Quebec mm-hmm. uh, got modified to sort of be the spirit of an animal, which oh. is strange. So you might see an all white cat that looks kind of like a ghost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a Luton. However, they also said that Lutons could be good or bad um, with powers ranging from control of the weather to shaving the beard of the master oh of the God. house. Before what? he woke on Sundays. Can you imagine such power? Such power would change a man, <laughs> would change a Luton. All that power. Yeah. It perverts the mind. What would you do with it? <laughs> Shave the master's Shave face. Shave him, I suppose. Um, evil or offended Lutons may harass the house owner with any number of minor troubles, such as blunting a scythe. You, oh. can't, you can't do your wheat work. Yep. <laughs> or filling shoes with pebbles. Oh my God. Luton. Luton. Trying to pull on your shoes. Some pebbles are coming out. Yeah. Salt is considered abhorrent to them. Oh. Uh, and they go out of their way to avoid crossing it when spilled on the ground. <laughs> that's got to be tough stuff. I was, I was going to say that like, that's like a lot of mythological creatures that you can do like a ring of salt around a ghost or something. Oh, that's like that. true. That's but true. But the yeah. phrasing here is funny. It's like it's spilled. Like it's not like a deliberate <laughs> spell to keep away a scary creature. It's just that like if somebody spills the Mortons, they're going <laughs> to. <laughs> really trying to work Who's, their way around it. Who spilled the Mortons? <laughs> yeah, and in particular, the phrasing of uh, they'll go out of their way yeah, to avoid like crossing so, it. It's a so nuisance. casual and every day. Yeah, it's not yeah. going to ruin their plans. You can't really catch them. They're just kind of like... They'd rather not. I, I mean, if I have to, I got to go all the way to go around. down to the bathroom to get to the living yeah. room. Come on. Try to be careful with the Mortons. Because little Jenny spilled the Mortons? Yeah. All right, I promise. The rest of this is all about the Na Rouge. Yeah. Those are all sort of detours okay. that orbit around the Na Rouge. Great. Here's to the, the thing world. itself. The earliest recorded um, uh, event surrounding a Na Rouge is 1883 in the Legends of La Detroit, hmm. where author Marie Caroline Watson described the Na Rouge as a dwarf who is, quote, very red in the face, <laughs> with a bright glistening eye, instead of burning it froze. Instead of possessing depth, emitted a cold gleam like the reflection from a polished surface, mm. bewildering and dazzling all who came within its focus. And it had a grinning mouth displaying sharp pointed teeth. Uh, that completed its strange face. Oh my God. <laughs> it's also described as a creature with red or black fur on sort of an animalistic body, but with the face of an old man who had blazing red eyes and rotten teeth. This is a tough-looking dwarf. The Na Rouge. That's a lot to take in. I love it, though, as sort of a distillation of a creature that is bad luck for to, to even look at it. Yeah, I would think. You know? That's, yeah. You can't have a, a bad... That's a lot of different aspects all in one thing absolutely and you can't have a creature that foretells doom yeah. that's pleasant to look at no absolutely not you know banshees with the wide open wailing face and the yeah. Nar rouge with its blazing red eyes right weird animal body and rotting teeth although you like, see that thing you know something's wrong however my topic later is going to talk about omens of good and bad and things like that and it's something that i find quite beautiful that some people have taken on as a bad omen so i guess it's in the eye of the beholder i mean maybe some people see the na rouge and they're like hachi machi chachi yeah maybe i hope the name hot. you know what i mean sure i hope the na rouge has somebody out there for it me too yeah. and ask for every seat absolutely or a seat for every ass and ask for every seat <laughs> whatever yeah um <laughs> legends hold that the na rouge's appearance would presage terrible events for the city the creature is said to have appeared on July 30th, 1763, before the Battle of Bloody Run, mm. where 58 British soldiers were killed. Um, supposedly, the Na Rouge danced among the corpses <laughs> on the banks of the Detroit River after the battle, and the river turned red with blood for days after. Ooh. Now, that doesn't seem like it's foretelling Doom. No, it seems like Doom just happened. Yeah, and then it was happy about it. That's some sort of trick to be like, I foretold that. I See, I told you this See was how happy happen. I am this because I told you yeah. it was going to happen. You just don't right. remember. And That's the people who I told, I definitely remember telling this guy, but he was one of the guys that died. Yeah, so like I guess they can't tell you, but just trust me, it was true. I foretold it. I portended I pretty happening. much saw it coming. Yeah. Got to hand it to me. I mean, maybe part of the idea, though, is that he's like, he'll show up and be like, something bad's going to happen. Uh huh. And then it does happen. Maybe that's when you get a warning like that, right? Like, yeah. I, I guess this is an interesting way to think of it. A banshee shows up and starts wailing in your face. Mm-hmm. Is that your opportunity to go, 
something bad's going to happen to me. Am right. I on this course and I can't avert? Or, or are you yeah. warning me because I can change it? Right. You know? Right. I would hope it's a warning because you can change it because otherwise what's the point kind of? Yeah. So maybe the Na yeah. Rouge is showing up to give you an opportunity mm -hmm. to try to fix this. Yeah, last chance. Yeah, last chance. Otherwise, it's the battle of bloody run for you. Right. And I'll be dancing around your corpse. Yeah. And they didn't change anything. And he's like, well, I warned you. And yeah. he just revels in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's... He revels in being right. It's like, and I told you so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. 100%. Um, <clears throat> according to the tale... All the misfortunes of Governor and General William Hull, leading to the surrender of Detroit in the War of 1812, are blamed on the Na Rouge. Ooh, that's convenient. <laughs> yeah, all of them. It had nothing General to do. General Hull is off the hook. Yeah, General William Hull yeah. doesn't play any part in anything that went down. Oh, it's the Na Rouge. The War of 1812. <laughs> it's that mischievous imp. Yeah. You've seen him. You know the guy. Of course you've seen him. Uh the Na Rouge has become an enduring part of the folklore of the Detroit area. Two workers claim to have seen the creature just before the uh, Detroit riots, and supposedly it was seen just before an ice storm in 1976. Cool. Yep. Uh, now, all right, this is uh, quite possibly one of my favorite things. I don't want to tell you this story twice because it would just be redundant, uh -huh. but I want to tell you the way that Wikipedia um, very quickly – Tells what's a, a more interesting story okay. that I found elsewhere. But on Wikipedia, they distill an encounter a person had with the the, the Na Rouge to like a hilarious degree. I find this a lot. Something that I'm like, I can't make heads or tails of this somewhere else on the internet. I will find it very short and condensed on Wikipedia in a way that I can. 100%. And yeah. they have done that. They gave me a bite-sized yeah. little tale of what it's like to, uh, to not heed the warning of the Na Rouge. Right. Uh, but it's like. There's so many more nuances to it that turned into like a fairy tale uh -huh. on other sites and on Wikipedia. They're like, nope, this happened, this happened, and then that happened because of it. Boom. It's hilarious. Yeah. It's great. So here we go. <clears throat> Detroit's founder, mm -hmm. one of the people credited with founding Detroit, was a man named Antoine de la Motte Cadillac. Okay. Cadillac, yeah. the car, is named after this guy. Okay. He's the founder of... Of Detroit. Founder of the feast. Now, this is in the year, the early 1700s, which places this a solid 180 years before yeah. the earliest recorded, oh. uh, uh, you know, writing of the Na Rouge. Yeah. The Na Rouge might have had his sticky little hands and things back then. Absolutely. But flying under the radar. Uh, 100%. Okay. So, <laughs> Cadillac was a fur and alcohol trader. He was a busy guy. <laughs> he was up to a lot of mischief. But he was also put in charge of a lot of stuff, including this French settlement that would eventually become Detroit. Yeah. Cadillac, at a party, was told by a fortune teller to appease the Na Rouge. But upon encountering the creature, he smacked it with his cane. Oh. And shouted, get out of my way, you red imp. The opposite of appeasing. As a consequence, a string of bad luck befell Cadillac. <laughs> he was charged with abuse of power. Okay. And reassigned to Louisiana. I mean, is that bad luck though? Like if he was if he was abusing power, it sounds like this guy got his just desserts. Right? Uh, <laughs> I think he's taking a page out of General Hull's book you can say that. and being like, Bad luck is befalling me. It's this because damn I damn red knocked, dwarf. Yeah, I knocked my cane into the Na Rouge. Yeah. It's not anything I did. I poked my knobbly cane betwixt his buttocks. <laughs> and this is what befell my fate. <laughs> Uh, he later returned to France where he was briefly imprisoned and lost all his fortune. <laughs> all right. That's how Wikipedia tells it. The, the, fortune, teller, oh, okay. the fortune teller says, appease the Na Rouge, be nice to the Na Rouge. And the next sentence is, when he encountered it, he hit it with his cane. <laughs> it makes it sound like he walked out yeah, the yeah, front yeah. door and was like, you're the thing that's supposed to make happy. Right. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> but no. On another website, which I love, by the way, Go check out Michigan's Other Side. <laughs> Michigas Other Side. <laughs> <laughs> There's all sorts of Michigas on this site. <laughs> uh, Michigansothersside.com. Their slogan, exploring the strange and unusual in the Great Lakes State. Great. I love any local weirdness website. 100%. Michigan's Other Side. 
we're on your team. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Michigan's their side. We're New Jersey, obviously. Damned Connecticut. Yep, 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 yeah, yep. If, if in your state you know of like a cool website like that, please send it to us at gttupod at gmail.com. We would love to see it. 100%. I would love to do like a 50 states thing eventually, like across the show. Mm-hmm. Remember on the Cold Bear Report, he was like, yes. part 93 of our my 1,045 part segment, Better Know a District, yeah, is going to cover all the district. districts of the United States. The show is so good. It's so good. Uh, so on their website, they do a deeper dive into the Nauru Rouge and the culture and what it means uh, for people who live in Detroit, for Michiganders. Yeah. Uh, and the way that they have posted the story is they talk more about um, this encounter between Cadillac and the Nauru Rouge like it is a classic fairy tale. Mm-hmm. That uh, Cadillac was, you know, a, a leader and so they were having this gigantic party and yes, a fortune teller came in and they thought – what fun will have her read our palms? Yeah. And she essentially went straight for Cadillac and started talking to him and warning him of, of ways to avert his doomed fate. Right. Uh, which, you know, kind of intrigued him a little bit. And she warned him that someday he might come across a curious little fellow. He's going to be that- a kid with an almanac. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and so he was just kind of like, ah, yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. Years go by. Years and years go by. And he's traveling with his wife through the hollow uh-huh. when they come across a, a little guy who cackles at them and gets in their way. And he essentially has had enough. And he boots this little <laughs> dude to the side and keeps moseying on. But yeah. that was the Na Rouge. And uh, he he lost his fortune. Yeah, he was hoping that he would, if nothing else, have a legacy that could, he could pass on to his heirs. No, Oof. and so it's a far more sort of like nuance. Granted, the beats are the same. Yeah, right, right. But Wikipedia got it right, but it's funny to be like appease yeah. the Nau Rouge, and then when he saw me. <laughs> Whacked him with his cane. I mean, that sounds like an old fairy tale or something like that. That Wikipedia entry where you're just like reading something, you're like, wait, we're here already? Okay. Yeah. They they just wrote things weird back then. You are right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That, yeah, it's like maybe time is condensed. Maybe maybe it did happen this rapidly, but maybe they're glossing over the fact that like three decades went by or something. Right. Right. But I just thought that was interesting. So, yeah. Totally. Michigansotherside.com. Cool. Check that out. Uh, I'll try to put links to all the things I'm talking about in in the show notes. The last thing that I have to say to you about the Na Rouge is that uh, since I think that this would be after Bobby and I started writing Edinburgh Falls, mm-hmm. um, the Na Rouge has taken on a new importance and a yeah. new life. For Good the for past it. nine-ish years, uh, there has been the March du Nai, Na Rouge yeah. in Detroit. It's uh, in, in every spring now, Detroit holds a costumed community parade called the March du Na Rouge in which the creature is traditionally chased out of the city, although the revival parade stays entirely within the Midtown neighborhood. So it's not everything. It's just kind of like a, a small little parade they yeah. do every year. Uh, at the conclusion of the parade, an effigy of the Na Rouge is destroyed. Love an effigy. Thus banishing the evil spirit from the city for another year. I love that. According to tradition, parade participants and spectators are encouraged to wear different costumes each year so that when the Na Rouge next returns, he will not recognize the persons who ousted him from the city limits and thus will not be able to seek personal vengeance. I love that. That's awesome. It's sort of an answer to Mardi Gras. Yeah, yeah. In That's what it says. It reminds me of like New Orleans. Absolutely. And obviously, like it's just sort of like the fun of the the – I don't know the the bigging up yeah, this, this there's, story the, there's of the Nauru. There's this story. And it's a celebration of culture. Yeah, right. It sounds like it's kind of a cool way to get together and do right. something that you all have in common. Like you guys all live in Detroit, so you all have like a connection to the Nauru. Totally. It's funny, and he, uh, it says here, the 2011 event featured a parade followed by the banishment and a party in the park drawing hundreds of guests. Mm. Hundreds? Yeah. Everyone, get out there. Yeah. People travel to New Orleans for Mardi Gras, head to Detroit in the spring to be at the March du Na Rouge. Yeah, why isn't the March du Na Rouge? You, who, there's, even some fun, there's even some fun combat going on because oh. in recent years – uh, a couple of organizations calling themselves the Friends of the Na Rouge and We Are Na Rouge. Oh my God, are they standing up for the Na Rouge's honor? Have protested the banishment parade. That's awesome. Arguing that the Na Rouge is not to blame for the city's ills. This is a smear campaign against Absolutely. the Na Rouge. And that considering Detroit's population loss, no one should be banished from the city, particularly those who have been there the longest. Like Na Rouge. 
Both groups also work toward making the event a celebration of Detroit's folkloric ancient guardian. I love that. I wish we had an event celebrating a folkloric hero. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. We should start the Jersey Devil Parade. I know. Awesome. I got to tell you, like, I, I don't as- associate Detroit with much because I just, I just don't know a whole lot about yeah, it. Yeah, I don't but have I think a lot of it as a city. Uh-huh. And I don't always associate folkloric characters no, neither with do I. cities. Yeah, you think so I'm of, very surprised to hear this. Yes, you think of like the the empty buildings and the car factory stuff and Eminem and I'm the movie say It Spaghetti. Follows. Yeah, yep. Mm-hmm. yep. And yeah, I just don't know much. I yeah. completely ignorant on the topic. But this was fascinating. Yeah, especially because I thought of myself as having a personal connection somewhat to the Na Rouge. Right, right. And I really like that. If this has only been going on for nine years, I truly think mm. that Bobby and I were trying to write about the Na Rouge. Uh, earlier than that. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Um, And so it's just like, I don't know, it feels vaguely personal to me. Uh-huh. I know it's like a character in a show we tried to write, so it's yeah. a little silly. But like, I, I've always had that little thing rattling around in my head. Yeah. Um, and you found out that it has this whole other big life. It's got this other life. Yeah. Yeah. It's like kind of exciting. That's um, awesome. I think it would be probably really fun to go to that. Yeah. yeah. That sounds sweet. I had no idea that that was happening at That's all. so cool. At all. Uh, but there you have it. The Na Rouge. The Na Rouge. If you see it, you better be nice to it. Yeah. <laughs> Do not hit it with your cane. No, fortune is going to befall you. Or Do bad fortune is going to befall you. Not no. hit it with your cane. I'm warning you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. That's uh, awesome. Um, yeah, and the, the last thing I want to say is that uh, the March du Nar Rouge 2019 is happening on March 24th. One month away. So if you're in the area, if you can get to that area, mm-hmm. get to safe ground. Go to the March <laughs> du Nar Rouge. Get to safe ground. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. tell them we sent you. Absolutely. Say hello. Absolutely. Uh, you might see a fellow uh, listener slash viewer there. Yeah. Yeah, you absolutely might. Other people who are interested in this kind of stuff who might live in the area. Love it. Or travel to it. Love it. Well, well there William, you go. speaking of traveling to places, you little baby William are going to Iceland. I am. Yeah. So am. as of the time that we're recording this, Will is going to be going in just a few days. Just a few days. Actually. I'll be flying out to Iceland. Yeah. And one of the things that you're going to be doing is seeing the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights. That's right. As I understand it. Yep. And I also understand that there are a bunch of legends, William, about the Northern Lights. One, oh, wow. Specifically about the Northern Lights? Yep. Well, this is like one of the like mystical things of our world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Fascinating. So I thought that I would tell you and our listeners slash viewers all about this so that you can enjoy it while you're gone, while you're watching the Northern Lights. You can have these little stories in your head. Magical. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Magical, mystical. So... What the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights are, if you don't know, I bet if you looked up a picture, you'd be like, oh, okay, like kind of know, I've seen this thing before. So there are these like very colorful, like moving, sort of swooping, graceful, really pretty, mostly green colored lights um, that are super ethereal looking. And they're predominantly seen in high latitude locations. So like at the poles is where they're seen like the most strongly. Right. Um they are so like the, it, they're called um the aurora borealis because that's a little mashup it's a combo of the name aurora who's the greek or roman goddess of the dawn and borealis meaning northern in latin oh i found that somewhere and then i saw something that said like borea means winds on another website so i'm a little confused but weird uh Weird thing that might be connected, yeah. and it's it's only weird for one very specific reason. Mm-hmm. The video game God of War, uh-huh. possibly God of War Two. Um, there is a horn that you have to blow into that creates like a tidal wave of wind that oh, okay. blows something away. It's and the I horn think of Borea? I think it's the horn of Borea. Interesting. I think it's a Greek god of wind. Okay, so that could be. Yeah. Look. Who knows where the hell these words come from, guys? God of War too. Yeah. <laughs> but the Aurora Borealis is that display that's also co- called the Northern Lights. So let me tell you what they actually are before I go into like the interpretations that people from around the world found for the Northern Lights, like mm. when they first came up and everything, and they made stories up about them or gave them explanations and things like that. Love it. What they really are, and I'm just going to quote directly from the website earthsky.org because I couldn't even paraphrase this because this is above my pay grade. I don't understand this. When charged particles from the sun strike atoms in Earth's atmosphere, they cause electrons in the atoms to move to a higher energy state. When the electrons drop back to a lower energy state, they release a photon. That photon? Light. The photon effect. 
photon fan. Um, this process creates the beautiful aurora or northern lights. Cool. Okay, so it looks like you're looking at like are. a galaxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it does. Yeah, that's like a good way to describe it. Um, so, like I said, they're mostly seen at the poles, but there have been times, mostly in the past, um, due to large flares or and or a lack of light pollution, that they've been seen other places in the world. And because of that, there are myths and legends about them from like all over the world. Hmm. So I divide them up into some categories that I'll go through rather than going through geographically. And I want to say off the top, I'm going to talk about this in very general terms where I'm like, the people of Sweden believe blah, blah, blah. I just didn't write it in a different way than that. I know that the people of Sweden don't believe now that the lights right. are babies or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just but like, say that off the top. historical it's, mythology. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So here's the category spirits of people. So there are a huge range of stories about the lights actually being spirits. Um, sometimes it's spirits rejoicing. Sometimes it's the spirits of people who died violently. Um, spirits who are stoked the sun went down, so now they can rule the night. Ooh. Like it really like runs the gamut. Basically. That's great. Um, so the Cree tribe in North America thought that the lights were just like a natural part of the circle of life and they were spirits of the dead who were remaining in the sky but just apart from their loved ones and the lights were their way to try to communicate with their loved ones by putting on this like beautiful show that's very nice i know a lot of these are nice a lot of these are like Ugh, yikes and there are some that are just very weird huh um Here's okay. Here come the weird ones. That's this is basically what I'm thinking. Oh about. hell yeah, uh, yeah. So um, Inuit tribes thought the lights were spirits of the dead playing a ball game using a walrus skull as the ball. So I don't totally understand how the lights translate to that. What I wonder is if you could kind of compare that to the whole thing of like thunder and lightning is God bowling and lightning are the pins cracking together. And when he gets a strike, that's thunder. Maybe the lights are created when like the walrus skull is bumping up against other stuff. Maybe. Or like something's like lost in translation a little bit in there. There might be a reason that it makes perfect sense that we're just not. There very well may be. But this story came up on multiple sites. And here's the weirder part. The reverse legend is what's told or what was told on um, Nunavik Island in Alaska, where it was the same story but reversed. It was walruses playing with the human skull of some poor sap is what I wrote. Oh, that's like a far side. <laughs> I know, like knocking it around with their big flappers. <laughs> or, or, yeah. Or. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's wonderful. Um, so the Mandan or Mandan uh, people of North Dakota thought that the lights might be fires over which great warriors were boiling their enemies in huge cooking pots. Whoa. Yep. So boiling their spirits. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That, <laughs> like a, yeah, an astral roasting. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ooh, that's the worst kind. Yeah. My uh, astral roasting was my band name. Hell yeah. You guys were sick. Yeah. Um, but not so fast. There was also a flip side to this fire story. The Algonquin thought that the lights were a fire built by their creator, Nana Bozo. Um, sorry, I'm not pronouncing that right. Um, as a way of reminding his people that he was there and he's watching over them. I like love that. A little bit of like a home fire is burning kind of thing. I love that. As yeah. long, even though I feel like I'm always predisposed to want to hear the spookiest. Yeah, there's some very sweet ones. Some of the ones that are kind and comforting are the ones that I. I respect the most and I like the most. Just Yeah. Uh, the, it's nice to look up, especially something that huge and vast, and think that it's something kind and comforting. Yeah. I don't want to think that it's God bowling. Right. And to Well, I guess God bowling isn't scary. But I don't yeah, want to think not, it's right. walruses bouncing around the head of a guy. Although, side note on that, could yeah. that be less about the game they're playing and more about it being like kicking Man up a lot of beast. dust? Because oh. the Aurora Borealis sort of has that like wavy, like yeah, a like cloud. Particles. Yeah. Is it like we kicked up a lot of dust up there that's a good question maybe Just that's where the game aspect comes in some sites refer to it as like a football like game okay that could mean soccer depending on which right. site that was good coming point. from but either way like yeah it was like a kicking game yeah. so maybe it is maybe it was like dust being kicked up but regardless the one of just being like i just want you to know that i'm here watching over you is yeah. such a, a kind somewhat mature way to look at something remarkable mm -hmm. that's completely you know natural but yeah, is still but beautiful and yeah inexplicable and come up with a very comforting reason why totally. why you should feel safe under the lights of the aurora borealis right i really love that it's sweet and again during this time these people might not have actually known that this was natural like sure we know that now but they could have been like oh my god this is like 
some stuff coming home to roost. This is scary, like apocalypse stuff. Like, who knows? Could be. And it's really nice to instead have the flip side be like, huh, this is a sign that like our creator is watching over us. I do wonder, though, like even even like in old, old, olden days, um, could there be people that are like, yeah, I mean, presumably the Aurora Borealis, though beautiful and mystical, is no different from any other weather formation. But for but for like the children or something like that, you know, like because yeah, like, it's like colorful for kids. Yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah. like right now if like there was a rainbow and it yeah. was like, look a rainbow, can we make a wish? You wouldn't you wouldn't be like, oh, that's just light being filtered through a prism and it's just this <laughs> full spectrum of light. Yeah. Obviously. Can you believe people used to think that that was like a leprechaun? Yeah. It's just nice. It's just nice. It's sweet. It's, it's just, beautiful. It's insane that these things are in yeah. nature. Yeah, and it's nice it's to insane. let yourself fantasize about yes. what they are. Yeah. Or just even even fantasies aside, just marvel that these are things that we get to experience. Totally. It's so insane. It is insane. There's so many things that are just givens that are so absolutely awesome. Rainbows? What, are you kidding me? It is bizarre. Yeah. They're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> in the parking lot of a Piggly Seriously, Wiggly. Look at that. The uh, freaking moon. Yeah. What are you kidding me? Yeah, it's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Stars. Yeah, I'm just walk around under them. You know, we're gonna it's stay crazy. in a million star hotel. You know what that is? No, that's where you're in a hotel room that's in yeah. the middle of nowhere, and it's essentially a bubble, um, a clear glass Stop bubble. Stop it, William. And so you have the full Wait, stars above you. Wait, you're staying there. We're doing that. Get the get out of here. Oh my god. Yeah, I'll do a live stream from in there to really diminish the importance of it. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <gasps> Are you doing a lot of other crazy things like that? Yeah, we're going to like walk on a glacier. Yeah. Yeah, I, I said I don't want to go kayaking because my feet will get claustrophobic my and I'll die. My feet will get wet. Yeah, <laughs> I really picture myself flipping over in a kayak and God. <laughs> drowning. So I, I won't no, be doing that. No, but that Million Star Hotel thing, that's a mind yeah, blower. Yeah, it's both beautiful and uh, – like what a, a unique way to be attached to nature, especially in a place that you've never been before that has such, you know, overwhelming beauty. It also is a very exposed position to be in yeah, that I a, can't help but think of as the premise for a horror movie starring me. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Where somebody's creeping around in the tree line as I'm gawking at the stars. Yeah. And then the next shot is like, I'm still gawking at the stars, but the camera pulls out and it's my head on a rock. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? That's also ideal because you get to be in nature, but not at the same time. Because like right. I love being out in nature, but like I have no desire to camp yeah. in a real way. It would be awesome to so, have a, like a king size four poster bed. Yeah, yeah, in the middle of the woods. Yeah, exactly. I like right. my comforts. So yes. you get to have that, but also kind of be in nature. It's gonna be crazy. That is so crazy. It's William. gonna be crazy. Oh my god. Okay. Oh boy, that threw me. That <laughs> sounds like a dream. Yeah. Okay. It's be nuts. So, um, so here are some mythical figures and creatures that are associated with some legends about the aurora borealis. Yeah. Um, in Greece, they so in you know in Greek mythology, um, Aurora was the sister of Helios and Selene, the sun and the moon, and so they had a story that the streaks of color in the sky were created from Aurora racing across the early morning sky in her chariot to tell her sis her siblings about the dawn of the new day coming. Love it. Cute, right? Um, this is. Cool to me because it's it's in a couple different ways. I'll just say it. So in China, seeing the aurora borealis was very rare. Like they weren't, they're not in an area of the world where that's like something that happens a lot. So there had to be like significant, surprising solar events that would make those lights even viewable to them. And apparently, it freaked out a lot of people. They're oh. just like, "What is this now?" Um, so it said that many of the early Chinese stories about dragons, like the origin of dragons being so closely tied to China, were from watching the green curl of the northern lights and then seeing kind of the lights as a, kind of like a celestial battle between good and evil dragons. That's excellent. Is that cool? Like, first of all, it's crazy to me that like you can't really see them that well there, but they something could happen that you see them and they're like, ah, what is this? Because they are totally unused to it. Like people who live in the poles are used to seeing them. So for a lot of those places, they actually don't have crazy legends about them. Because it's a common feature. It's a common feature. So a lot of these, what, these legends are coming from places where they're uncommon because they had to be like, oh God, what's that? That's wild. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I know. Um, so in Norse mythology, the, they thought that the lights were were um, reflections or glow from shields of the Valkyrie fighting. It's so like, you know, like the warrior women. And it was also believed that the Aurora Borealis was something called the Bitfrost Bridge. Oh, the Bifrost. Oh, OK. Yeah. This is the Rainbow Bridge. Oh, what do you mean? That are like that pets go on? What? You know what I mean? They call like crossing the Rainbow Bridge when dogs die. 
Well, they don't know cocoa's on that farm, <laughs> right? Mom told me. No, the, the Bifrost is the the way that uh, well, in the Marvel movies, Thor travels between realms. Well, that makes a lot of sense because this is how it's a glowing arc that leads fallen warriors to their final resting place in Valhalla. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They, that's a, a means of travel that's kind yeah. like Tony Stark could yeah. use the Bifrost. Well, if Heimdall lets him. <laughs> Who's Heimdall? I think I've that's right. Of- I think that's Idris Elba in the Thor movies. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> awesome. So yeah, so they it's said in Norse mythology that the Aurora Borealis is that Bifrost bridge. Right. Um, in Finland, it's thought that those colors were sparks from the tail of a fire fox running so quickly across the snow and ice that his tail caused sparks. And I thought it's like tails. That's Sonic. great. He yeah. goes so fast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, oh, and the, okay, I forgot. I want to end on the other one that I thought was very cute and nice. Um, so in two. Okay, anyway. So in Gaelish folklore in Scotland, the lights are actually called Na Fir Chlis, Okay. Um, meaning the nimble men. And the lights were thought to be the fights of sky warriors or fallen angels. So again, I think that clashing of things, basically. And then this is so cool to me. They say that the blood from those battles fell down to earth and spotted bloodstones, which are stones, um, also known as heliotrope, which is also the name of a flower, which I know is confusing, but it is a stone that's found in Scotland. And I looked it up. It's a sort of jasper where it's like greenish, but then it has spots of red on it. That's so, so it's cool. It's got a legend that this stone is that way because it's a blood falling from the Aurora Borealis battles. That's wild. Awesome, right? That's great. So then this cute one is that um, the Menno uh, Mini tribe of Wisconsin thought that the lights were torches of friendly giants spearfishing at night. Oh, that's they're just, nice. They're just lighting their path. That's like Hagrid. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's so cute. So there's also a lot of baby stuff, baby lore oh. associated with the Aurora <laughs> Baby lore. I studied baby lore. Yeah. Nobody wants to talk to me at parties. <laughs> um, so Japanese culture says that um, a child conceived under the Northern Lights will be blessed with good looks, intellect, and good fortune. And apparently um, that's kind of like a uh, a storyline in a lot of Southeast Asian South. East Asian countries, and that there has been an increase in tourism from Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries, to um, places where you can see the Northern huh. Lights, partially because of that kind of really? like, rumor. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, Icelandic people believe that the Northern Lights soothe the pain of childbirth, so you could be lucky out if you go into labor while the Northern Lights are going on. But don't look at those lights while you're giving birth. If you do, that baby's going to be cross-eyed. <laughs> what? That's the the full threat. Yeah. Wow. Full threat. That's the full thing you're risking. Yep. That baby might baby. be cross-eyed. Yeah. Wow. Otherwise, totally fine, but cross-eyed. So huh. if that's something that you're not, you know, too hot on. Make sure you're averting your case. Oh, you know, gets kicked by a goat, eyes go crossed, <laughs> fall down a well, eyes go back again. I don't know. <laughs> and then this is very sad, but also kind of sweet at the same time. In Greenland, um, they have a thought that the lights are the souls of children who died at birth. And they're playing and kind of like dancing and um, the streaming lights are them kind of moving and being happy. That's nice too. Just a sort of comforting notion for people who have been through a bit of hell. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Something beautiful that you can look at that's like insane and like ununderstandable. Right. You can attach to something like that that's insane and ununderstandable in a much different horrible way. Yeah, opposite end of the spectrum. Totally. Okay, so it's good news, bad news time. Time to talk about omens. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, love omens. Love, love omens. a good omen. Yeah. Um, so the times that they showed up in Europe were similar to like in – where else was I talking about where they showed up that was scary? I think in China where it was unexpected. They're not used to seeing them and they were terrified of them. So in France and Italy, they assumed and thought that they were bad omens, heralding anything from war to plague to death. Like these things showed up. They're unexplained. What the hell is this? This must mean something bad. Bad. What is in the sky? Yeah. Right? And that would even be a thing where you'd be like, everybody leave your homes. Look. Look. Right. You know, like that's yes. like Independence Day when Will Smith wakes up in the morning. They just look out the window and yeah. everyone's like staring up in the sky. They're like, what's going on? I mean, honestly, I think they're beautiful and I, I know what they are. It would freak me yes. right out. I would not think it was beautiful if off the bat. you've never heard of this before. You have no frame if of it reference happened for today, this. today, I would think it was scary. I'd be like, 
they're not meant to be here. Oh, even uh, literally in Aurora Borealis. Like yes. you'd be like, you're not supposed to see them from New Jersey. No, I think there are some parts from New- in New Jersey where you can see them very, very, very faintly. Really? Or there was, a, there was like a day where it was like predicted that it was going to be like a crazy one or something like that. Because I remember thinking about driving somewhere to see it. But then I think I remember reading about it and it was like, if there's any fog, you can't. I was just like, forget it. Right. But like. You no. might catch a twinkle. <laughs> Maybe. But like, no, if they were like full force, like beautiful northern lights, but here. I'd yeah. be like, something is so wrong. Something's weird. Did the atmosphere rotate around that's the what I'm planet? Saying. It's, that's that's not things natural. are misaligned. Yeah, it would freak me right out. So I can totally understand that. Um, but in Sweden, even though it was unexpected, so same kind of thing. Like they're like, what is this? But they're like, hey, all right, party. They thought it was good news. They thought that it was a gift from the gods and it was providing warmth and light. This part I find a little confusing. It was providing warmth and light coming from an unseen volcano. Volcanoes are kind of scary. Yeah, so that, adds a, that adds a sinister yes. element to me. But whatever. In Sweden, Pompeii. Yeah, exactly. Ever heard of it? Right. But in Sweden, they're stoked about it, so fine. Um, in certain areas of the country, they thought it was the reflection from large groups of herring, which boded well for fishermen and farming communities because it was showing signs of a good harvest to come. Oh, okay. So they were like, "This is this is good news all around." Whether it's from an unseen volcano providing us with warmth and light. Or it's showing us that they're like a lot of sweet fish that we're going to go after. Things are going to be good with these lights. If I had more harvests in my life, maybe I would have more omens. Because it seems like a lot of omens used to be about like, it's going to be a bad harvest. That's true. Don't do a lot of harvesting. The harvest moon means nothing to me. No, me neither. It's it's cool, but like it doesn't impact my life in any way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we'd be a little more connected to. uh, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm going to be looking at that so thing. Tuck those in your pocket. I'll be thinking of dragons. I'll yeah. be thinking of the clashing Valkyries. All kinds of stuff. That's really cool. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Hagrid yeah. fishing, spear fishing? Spear fishing with a torch to light his way. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Hagrid. All yeah. right. All right. <laughs> Nodding at me from up on high. Yeah. <laughs> Peeking at me. <laughs> um, a twinkle in his eye. Yeah. You can tell a fish on his spear. The, his bushy beard is... <laughs> You can tell his smile is concealed behind that bushy beard. There's a smile in there. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. That's yeah. great. Yeah. The Aurora Borealis. That's right. So enjoy it. I hope you guys enjoyed it at home. Absolutely. Cool. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of Guide to the Unknown. That's right. Uh, the Na Rouge, bad omen. Mm. The Aurora Borealis, good omen. Mixed bag. Well, <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We're close to positive news. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But there you go, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Hope you had a good time. Please go out there. Go check out at GTTU pod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to uh, see posts throughout the week. You can join. Well, I just heard whispers of something happening on Facebook.com slash group slash GTTU pod. Yeah. There's just whispers coming through a door. I don't know. Can you gain entry? Let's see. You can also go to patreon.com slash GTTU pod if you'd like to give a little something back to mm-hmm. the show. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, you can always follow us individually. That's right. I'm at Chillin' Kristen on Instagram. I'm at Haunted Sponge. So we will see you next week yeah. for another dazzling, uh, frightening episode of Guide to the Unknown. But until that time comes... We must travel. Well, you quite literally. Hmm. Will will travel to Iceland, and I guess I'll, well, I guess I'll just go back to the netherworld. (laughs) Have fun in there alone. (laughs) Bye. Bye.